Now, this article here is from the Telegraph. It goes into this to an extent using uh, Niall Ferguson's brilliant, his impeccably right-wing analysis. It's not right-wing at all, but again, Dunning Poe must play the right-winger. There's no right-wing or left-wing in this system, by the way. Uh, of why it is that the West is going to hell in the handcart just it gets better and better. It's in the latest episode, he explores how the roots of the Holocaust lay in a dry-run genocide carried out by the Germans. And he says, who else? Well, the English were doing it before the Germans. In German southwest Africa, now Mabibia, in the 1900s against the Herero and Namak uh, natives. Around 80% of the former tribe and 50% of the latter were brutally massacred, with many of the survivors sent to concentration camps where the racial characteristics were studied by Proto Dr. Mengele's as part of the fashionable new scientific field popularized by Francis Galton. And that was eugenics. I should add too that Britain was already doing it uh, in the Boer War because they were the ones who first came up with the concentration camps uh, for the Dutch settlers. And actually they were doing it in Scotland long before that, but that's another story. Now, it also says here, uh, the important point to note is that 100 years ago, work like Galton's was at the cutting edge of scientific research. And you should always remember that whatever's the latest is, is the godlike decree, and that's how science runs. Racism wasn't some backward-looking reactionary ideology. It was a state of the art, and people then believed in it as readily as people today buy the theory of man-made climate change. This is what Ferguson said. Obviously, if you're a believer in the church of climatism, this will sound like a monstrous slur, but it does also have the virtue of being true. As I note in my really quite soon-to-be-published book, uh, Watermelons, the values of the eugenics movement and of the modern green movement are closely connected. Actually, Rockefeller brought them both together many years ago. Here, for example, is a popular 50s environmentalist called Harrison Brown in a book called The Challenge of Man's Future, published in 1954, discussing how to make the human species healthier. Uh, Thus, we could sterilize or in other ways discourage the mating of the feeble-minded. We could go further and systematically attempt to prune from society by prohibiting them from breeding persons suffering from serious inheritable forms of physical defects, such as congenital deafness, dumbness, blindness, or absence of limbs. Actually, they've gone way beyond that now. They even talk about allergies. Uh, Brown, you've gathered, was a keen eugenicist. Well, fine, so were lots of people back then. Despite the setback, their junk, junk science philosophy experience with the end of Nazi Germany. But the point about Brown is that he was not just some ordinary bloke of no consequence. He was and is revered by many in the modern green movement as a key politi- uh, philosophical guru. Amongst his biggest admirers is John Holdren, the green activist who is now President Obama's director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, a.k.a. his science czar. In 1986, Holdren edited and co-wrote an an homage entitled Earth and the Human Future, Essays in Honor of Harrison Brown, in which he claimed 30 years after Harrison Brown elaborated these positions, it remains difficult to improve on them as a coherent depiction of the perils and challenges we face. Brown's accomplishment is in writing. The challenge of man's future, of course, was not simply constructing of his sweeping scheme for understanding the human predicament. More remarkable was and is the combination of logic, thoroughness and clarity, etc., etc. Back with more after this break. Hi, folks. We're back and we're cutting through the matrix reading an article here uh, by Dylan Poe from The Telegraph, uh, and he's quoting up from a book um, by Ferguson. And they're also exposing in the book how uh, we, we find people in charge like John Holdren today, the science czar of Obama, uh, writing, a, 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 a writing in praise, basically, of a top eugenicist who wanted the state uh, to sterilize people com- by compulsion and uh, tests everyone before they'd have offspring for to make sure they had the, the, the proper kind of genes to have offspring, not the bad kind of genes, and so on. And that's, that man's name uh, was Harrison Brown, and that's what uh, Holdren said. It says, 30 years after Harrison Brown elaborated these positions, it remains difficult to improve on them as a coherent depiction of the perils and challenges we face. Brown's accomplishment in writing The Challenge of Man's Future, of course, was not simply the construction of this sweeping schema for understanding the human predicament. More remarkable was and is the combination of logic, thoroughness, 
and clarity and force which he marshaled data and argumentation on every element of the problem and of their interconnections. It's a book, in short, that should have reshaped permanently the perceptions of all serious analysts. As author of this damning essay on the subject notes, as recently as 2007, Holdren was reiterating his admiration for Harrison Brown's noxious views. Now, you better be very concerned when guys like this are placed uh, as an advisory capacities uh, to presidents and prime ministers, because Britain's got them too, these unelected, these new boards of officials unelected of of so-called scientists. It says, Holder and Let It Be Not Forgotten is also the author of this chilling paragraph from a book he wrote in 73 with a fellow neo-Malthusian doom-monger, uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich, with the, his wife Anne Ehrlich, uh, called Human Ecology Problems and Solutions. And in the book it says, A massive campaign must be launched to restore a high-quality environment in North America and to de-develop the United States. As I say, that's why they're rewelding you under Agenda 21 and so on. And, and your, your factories have all gone off to China. Resources and energy must be diverted from frivolous and wasteful uses in overdeveloped countries to filling the genuine needs of underdeveloped countries. The effort must be largely political, done through politics and treaties, obviously. So thank you, Neil Ferguson, for totally getting it. The sooner sufficiently large numbers of people are aware that, for all its fluffy pretensions, the Green Movement is rooted in pessimism, grotesque misanthropy, and rabid anti-capitalism. The sooner we'll be able to consign it to the dustbin of history next to all those other bad ideas that seemed so good to so many idiots at the time. Eugenics, for example. And uh, as I say, don't get lost with right-wing, left-wing capitalism, communism. It's all the same thing because the same boys at the top ran it all and created them, actually. But there you go. Eugenics is alive and well. And a lot of them are cheering, actually, at the top because of the radiation that's spilling across the planet. You see, in reality, there are three levels of reality, physics and and, uh, biology and so on, Uh, even pharmacology. I've already mentioned some higher drugs that the elites take in these times that uh, supposedly prevent the genes from uh, altering when they're, they're hit with radiation. And in other words, they can stop being uh, mutated. They just simply um, reproduce themselves as before. But there's much higher drugs than that that are guaranteed to work, and you'll never hear of those ones, folks. They haven't sat on their, their hands for the last 60 or 70 years waiting for something to happen because the elite's first tenet is their own survival. They make sure that all work has gone into searching, not research, but searching for all the things to make themselves, to ensure their own survival. Now, this ties in with an article that came out at the same time. These are all coming out at the same time under this massive crisis that's going on, uh, because you can slip so many much stuff through. Stop having children instead of bleating about conservation, says wildlife expert. Human beings must stop having children if they want to save the planet's endangered species, according to the leading wildlife expert. And it says, Chris Packham, the BBC presenter, said the government should offer financial rewards to couples to opt to remain childless. Setting out his radical approach, Packham said, there's no point bleating about the future of pandas, polar bears and tigers when we're not addressing the one single factor that's putting more pressure on the ecosystem than any other, namely the ever-increasing size of the world's population. And then it goes on to the usual quotes. I read the other day that by 2020, there are going to be 70 million people in Britain. Let's face it, that's too many. Well, actually, see, most of that in Britain already at the moment are from immigration. Let's get the other side of the story to the first world countries here. The reason first world countries are, are, are being flooded is because they say there's not enough people having children to pay off the debts. Huh? How about that, Chris Packham? You don't mention the other reality. You understand how a perception can be altered by omission? Hmm? And they do it all the time, these characters. He says, I wouldn't actually penalize people for having too many children as I think the carrot always works better than the stick. So I guess we're just a bunch of rabbits. But I would offer them a tax break for having small families, say 10% of your tax bill, if you decide to stick with just one child and an even bigger financial incentive if you choose not to have a family at all. I question the way, for example, people have two children with one partner, then split up and have two with their next partner just to even up the score. Really? Fact is, we all eat food, breathe air, require space, and the more of us there are, the less of those commodities there are for other people and, of course, for the animals. And remember, this world order is to be a world order. So they must flood the first world countries in 
as their own populations are declining. So it gets seen that we're, we're, we're overcrowded everywhere. They're not building bigger cities, by the way. They're just crowding more and more and more folk in them until eventually you'll look like they used to show you in, in India. They'd show you somewhere in Delhi, for instance, the same old street, but crowded it was. They don't show you that most of India is jungle and forest and, and very few folk living anywhere. Perception again, isn't it? This is uh, Packham... Uh, uh, Packer Kamet says here has no children of his own but does have a 16 year old stepdaughter the co-host of the BBC Spring Watch program said that everyone must do their bit for the environment if I didn't recycle the shop locally uh, and shop locally I couldn't see the point in being human well I don't think you are human mate because you see you don't have the right to tell any other creature what to do see you're not elected you see to anything and, and no one's given their vote to you and I wonder what boards you sit on and who funds those boards now let me take a guess. Hmm? And this ties in with another one here. This article came out of the Telegraph. Test children's genes before they have sex. Do you see how they're on a roll right now? And so many articles are actually related. And many folk will read these little articles in between other bits of news. And because of the, the overflow of data they get, they don't really realize that these are all coming out at the same time, obviously for a reason, to alter the way that you think about things. Test children's genes before they have sex. Children should be encouraged to undergo genetic testing before they become sexually active to check whether they could pass on hidden abnormalities to their offspring, a government advisory group will say this week. It's all done in advance, you see. Now that ties in with what I just read there about Brown, the guy that uh, you know, Ferguson was talking about, that John Holdren holds up as the high guru of environmentalism and sustainability. So here they want to do their same old thing they've been talking about for over a hundred years, where the state will interfere and say who can breed and who shall not breed. That's what it's about. The test raised questions about the extent to which doctors should intervene in nature. The Human Genetic Commission. Now, who are the Human Genetic Commission? Did you even know you had one? will recommend that so-called preconception tests should be much more widely available. The screening allows specialists to see if potential parents are, are hidden carriers of genetic conditions. Now, this whole science is proven to be bogus over and over again. When you look at the actual science and the data and so on, it's bogus because they can't predict it at all if you're going to get a particular disease whatsoever. They say you might be prone to this, you might be prone to that. And, and you might not be, that also means you might not be prone to this or that, you see. <laughs> it says, that the, uh, the tests raise questions about the extent to which doctors should intervene in nature, suggesting that children have their genetic makeup analysed will be add, added to the controversy. The commission was asked in 2009 to review the ethical and legal questions surrounding preconception testing and will present its findings to the Department of Health this week. It's concluded that there are strong reasons to make preconception testing widely available to anyone who needs it based on the principle that parents should have the maximum information and autonomy over the reproductive decisions. Sure, this is a foot in the door, folks, and eventually it will become mandatory. And then when you look into this, this, this particular group, on their home page, and I'll put all these links up tonight at cuttingthroughmates.com. Who are they? It says, well, we are the UK government's advisory body on new developments in human genetics and how they impact on individual lives. We give the government advice on human genetics with a particular focus on the social, ethical, and legal issues. One of our key roles is to promote debates and to listen to what the public and their stakeholders have to say. Now, are the public, you understand, that's separate from their stakeholders. Who are their stakeholders? Hmm? Well, they're the guys that own you folks and the guys that pay this private company. Apart, they also get funding from your tax money. We are committed to openness and transparency, they say. Well, tell us who your stakeholders are. Tell us who's backing you. Hmm? The commission is made of 21 members, including experts, experts again in genetics, Ethics, Law and Consumer Affairs. The chair is Professor Jonathan Montgomery. We also have a consultative panel of people who have different experience of living uh, with genetic conditions and to act as a sounding board for our reports and recommendations. So you have to go through a a Freedom of Information Act to get any more stuff on these characters. But so genetics uh, and eugenics is alive and well, and they're on a roll to depopulate. Because remember, Mr. Rockefeller called for that last year. He says, we've got to stop just looking at uh, uh, pregnancy prevention and abortion. He says, we've got to now go into a phase of rapid depopulation. 
I wonder if he knew this thing was going to happen in Japan. I just wonder, you know. Never, never dismiss anything at all. Makes you wonder, folks, because they always seem to get what they want.